Welcome. It's exciting to be here. Thanks for joining us for this game changer with What School Could Be. My name is Kopono Siaria. I'm the executive director of What School Could Be, and I'm joined by my co-host today, Mel Ching. Hey, Mel. Hi, Kopono. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for being here. I'm excited about this conversation for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, I'll probably share more of them as we uh, as we get into today. Um, but specifically, um, our guests, uh, Ron Berger and Dr. Uh, Bob Peters, um, I've been waiting to have this conversation for a really long time. So uh, I think we're in for a treat. Um, I, I want to start by introducing um, Ron Berger. Uh, Ron Berger is a senior advisor at EL Education, a nonprofit school improvement organization that partners with public schools and districts across America, uh, leads professional learning, and creates an open, educa open educational resources. Uh, he's a well-known keynote speaker nationally and internationally on inspiring uh, a commitment to quality, character, and citizenship in students. Uh, Ron's been the author of best-selling education books, including An Ethic of Excellence and many others. Uh, he is also uh, the uh, main person behind one of uh, my most used educational videos, uh, Austin's Butterfly. Ron was a member of the U.S. National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development, uh, and his prior work uh, with Ron was a public school teacher, a master carpenter in rural Massachusetts for over 25 years and received an Autodesk Foundation National Teacher of the Year Award. Ron, we're really excited to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Capono and Mel, for inviting me and for having me join Bob. And on that, uh, let me introduce everybody to uh, Dr. Robert G. Peters. Uh, Bob served as Hanaho Oli, head of school from 1992 to 2013. He received a doctorate in education from uh, the University of Massachusetts with a concentration in foundations of education and curriculum design. Uh, he currently serves as the chair of Hawaii State Early Learning Board uh, and is president of the Samuel N. and Mary Castle Foundation Board of Trustees. Uh, Dr. Peters has taught graduate curriculum courses for University of Hawaii and, uh, and uh, the HAIS Master's Program in Private School Leadership. He is primary instructor in an annual summer institute titled the Hanaholi Teacher Collaboration, an institute for interdisciplinary curriculum design. Uh, and uh, probably the thing that uh, I am most excited about, Dr. Peters, uh, is my kindergarten principal. So certainly everything that I needed to learn, uh, I've learned from him and continue to go back to him as my educational mentor, even today with all this extra gray hair that I've uh, gotten since that time. Bob, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. And um, both you and Mel at least have hair, as does Ron, um, which is encouraging. And it's interesting to note that I'm delighted to be here with Ron, not only because I know what he has to has offered to education, but the fact that we hail from a similar part of the country in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, his office is not very far from where I got my degrees and where I lived for a while. So, Ron, it's really great to work with you today. Thank you, Bob. Mel? Yeah. Great. Well, I, I wanted to open today, especially after listening to those bios, um, by asking you folks, you know, you have a lot of experience in education. Is there anything that's come up recently, though, not just a trend, but something that you are excited about that makes you very hopeful for the, the state of education, especially for our, our youngest learners in elementary? Well, I'll jump in. Um... One of the things that excites me the most right now is, is less about the nature of the field than the urgency that people feel are, are expressing around the importance of quality early learning experience for young children, particularly threes, four-year-olds, and actually the zero to five continuum. And beginning to look at zero to three, third grade, as having connections across the curriculum as opposed to turning into an academic boot camp around the beginning of kindergarten and first grade. Um, that conversation is a really exciting one to me and the fact that there is, even on the federal level, despite the lack of funding, some real urgency around uh, equity issues with regard to access to quality opportunities for everything. Thanks. Um, Mel, it's nice to start with something positive. Um, 
On, on last, last Friday, I was visiting one of the schools in our EL education network. They're a school that uses our free open source uh, ELA, literacy curriculum, which is now used by about half a million students nationally. And this was one school that's using it. And it is an amazing school. I spent time in the kindergarten. I spent time with the young students and then older students. It's a K to eight. This uh, in Massachusetts, not far from where Bob and I have done work and then been in school, there is a, a restored colonial village called Sturbridge Village. It's one of those villages where all the houses are, are from 1830 and all the people dress in period costume and they do crafts. They do woodworking and pottery and weaving and raise animals. This school, Old Sturbridge Academy, was built on the grounds of the, of the village. And so the students themselves are immersed in this living history museum where they can work with animals and plant crops and, and work in a pottery studio and work as docents and work and create exhibits. I saw an exhibit that kids had created for the museum there where they did all the interpretive signs and all the research. Um, and they also did a project around voices of people of color that were around in that colonial time, but whose voices often weren't heard or weren't seen. So they, create, they created a book to honor local people of color who were part of that colonial community, but, were, but their voices have been sort of lost over time. The agency of even from the littlest kids, from the kindergartners up was just inspiring for me. I'd love to stick on this for just a second more or, or, or a few more minutes. Um, you know, we talked earlier, right before we went uh, live here, just about how so many of the examples of deeper learning, educational transformation, uh, this type of work, the four C's work, project-based learning, um, expeditionary learning. So many of the examples that we share uh, are examples of older kids, specifically high school kids. And yet there's so many cool examples, uh, Ron, like you just shared uh, with, with that. And, and you said something that, that, stuck with, that, that stuck out to me, which was that these kids, these youngest learners here, um, have agency. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you both wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about um, our youngest learners, uh, be it early childhood or, or lower elementary, um, and this kind of uh, uh, the, the tension between you need to learn the foundations first before or uh, both and or th th there's, there's an order of learning that many attribute. Uh, they have to learn how to read and do al uh, algebraic uh, uh, equations before, and then they can get to that cool stuff later. Mm -hmm. uh, what's been your experience with this? Bob, why don't you go first? Sure. Yeah. All right, if, if you'd like to, me too. Um, <clears throat> generally, I think what you're describing is the way a good bit of education is, although the conversation is shifting, I think, and um, we see more and more examples of, um, schools that are looking at how, how do you engage children? And engaging children is allowing them the opportunity to explore areas of interest they have. And, you know, let's face it, all learning really has a lot to do with um, figuring out who you are in the world and how the world works. And if you're invited to ask those kinds of questions, then the opportunities arise for you to utilize or realize the need to develop those skills and put them into application. Um, let me share one very concrete example, which is with fourth and fifth graders that I um, became aware of this past year at Hanaho'oli. Um, those of you who may be listening in from Hawaii are familiar with the water issues this past year, particularly with Red Hill and the naval um, leakage of fuel into the water aquifer and the the problems that resulted, but also the general generalized concerns about water protection. Um, and this group of fourth and fifth graders at Hanaho'oli spent a good bit of their time becoming water protectors, if you will, and communing, communicating with uh, local experts around the field, but also engaging with politicians to figure out how do you move issues forward and bringing those issues to the legislators through their own writing, um, through their own poster making. They were uh, doing PSAs and, and uh, 
providing educational opportunities for parents and families within the school and beyond, which not only gives them a sense of their voice, but laying the foundation for what we hope democratic citizenship is going to be. It gives meaning to the skills that you acquire because you have an opportunity to apply them in a meaningful way rather than um, totally disjointed from anything that you're really studying. And, and that's not to say that there aren't times when you need to have distinctive instruction in skill development. That's important as well in order to give the tools that are necessary. But it's not necessary to have all the tools beforehand to be a learner and a deep learner. Bob, I agree entirely. And this idea that you'd have to sequence one ahead of the other is just silly. I mean, we can learn to be great readers and writers through studying important things and making contributions. You know, I, I mean, I mentioned this free curriculum that we've created that's been, it's being used by almost half a million students right now. And it's based on the science of reading. It's got the highest reports in the country from Ed Reports, which is like the consumer reports of curriculum. It's based entirely on literacy standards. And yet the kindergartners and first graders are studying trees and they're studying birds and they're out and they're drawing and they're learning and they're working to preserve environments and save trees and can do be a part of a bird census and count things and like become stewards of the environment. The third graders are studying frogs and they're creating field guides to local frogs. The, the fifth graders are studying human rights and like a bunch of fifth graders in Detroit took on this, this campaign they created called Literacy as a Civil Right. And they decided one of the human rights we need to preserve is every kid deserves to be literate. And they built little free libraries for their community where, you know, the miniature libraries that they put on street corners. So, and the, it, you know, they're learning to read and write with rigor at the same time. Our curriculum includes phonics work. It includes all of the basics but you don't have to separate those basics from kids doing exciting, real hands-on work and learning to be stewards of their communities and environment and contributing to the world. Like that's what motivates them. One other, if, I wanna add one other thing, if I may. One of the things that it strikes me has been happening for years and years and unfortunately continues to happen. Um, the commitment to skill development, because it's measurable. I think that's a good part of the reason. Um, oftentimes not only occurs an absence of real content, but children are given things to do without anything to think about. And if they don't have something to think about, then obviously there's no motivation to really produce something that has any high quality. Why, why would you care? Now, I've noticed that some of the more recent textbook series, and I'm not talking about Ron's DL program, but the general textbook series are making claims that they are integrating uh, content. But really what they're doing is offering subject matter in the, particularly in the readers um, that I see coming out that have no relationship to broader ideas. You address them in a week's time, which is never enough time for something in depth and meaningful for children. Um, and then you move on to the next um, read, reading piece that, that's provided. So while there's some well-intentioned or maybe well-packaged is a better word, um, presentations um, in the commercial world that are being marketed, I don't think yet they have the substance. I mean, what is it that's going to grab kids' interest? What's going to excite them? Where are they going to see that their learning has real utility and that they're responsible for that learning and they can take that responsibility? Those are all critical attributes of this thing we call developing lifelong learners that we're supposedly all committed to. Hey, um, Mel, I, uh, I'm going to turn the tables on you for a second. I want to ask you a quick question. Mel and I uh, shared time together uh, at YLI uh, school, elementary school in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, and YLI was, uh, was founded uh, what, almost, almost 35, 40 years ago uh, in, in, in partnership with Hana Ho'oli, Bob, where uh, you were uh, leading when YLI first uh, formed its charter and its uh, its vision and mission, uh, Mel. When, you know, while we were both there, one of the things we often struggled with was um, balancing, uh, you know, the, the core element of a YLI experience, integrated thematic units, uh, mm -hmm. with with the the, the dis 
discrete skills instruction or specifically the time to do really good skills instruction like uh, in, a, in a workshop model or through uh, applied mathematics. You know, having spent, well, how many, how, how long were you there? Almost three decades, two and a half decades, something like that. A couple something decades. Something like that, <laughs> a couple two decades. decades. Yeah. For, the, for the two decades that you were there, um, what's, what's been your experience? How have you seen this play out with actual kids, uh, your own kids, uh, other kids? Uh, how, how does this work? Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting question, Kapona, I think. Um, while we struggle with the design of the thematic units, I think, and the time that's involved, whether it's the designing of it or the implementing with the kids, once you get it going, I think you'll actually find that it does save time. You know, they're really learning things in an, in an integrated way. Um, the concepts and skills make sense. And Bob, you had brought up earlier um, kind of those questions about who am I, how does my world work, and that other piece about how do I fit in it, and what can I do um, to, to make my world a better place. And I think those are the pieces that when you see kids get that, it makes a lot of sense, and it, it, makes, it makes it easier to actually talk to people who might question that way of teaching and learning. I uh, remember talking to a lot of uh, middle school teachers uh, where we sent our kids uh, who always said they could tell our kids coming from a mile away because uh, they were the ones who were going to question and everything. Uh, yeah. everything and respond and try to make meaning. And uh, uh, they weren't always the easiest ones to have in middle school classes, but they were certainly the most exciting. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Hey, uh, Ron, you know, I, we got to talk uh, at, uh, in San Diego at the Deeper Learning Conference about the, um, the language arts curriculum and specifically the social justice aspect of it. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Because I think that's really, it's a compelling thing I would have wanted to, uh, to have my, 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 my kids uh, be even more involved in social justice, even at that younger age. I think, Capono, kids of every age worry a lot about what's fair and what's right. And they want to do good for the world. They want the world to be a better place. And so if we can get the curriculum to tap into that virtuous side of kids, it, it, it puts a spark in their heart for that work. I mean, our, as I said, our, our, our first fifth grade module is called Human Rights. And they start by reading the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Like, what rights should all people have? That comes from the United Nations. And they think about what rights do we have in our community? What rights should we have in our community? How do we help people in our community have the rights they deserve in this country? Um, and it is, it's a powerful and generative topic for kids of every age. Kids always worry about what's fair and right. Little kids, kindergartners and first graders all the time. And so I think if we can connect our curriculum to, to virtuous character, to being a good person in the world, being a good citizen, helping to make things more right and more fair and more just, I don't know what kid would not connect with that. And I, I certainly would agree. And I think one of the other things though, that we have to be wary of is that we don't set aside social justice time in the day, but that instead we live it within the fabric of the community that you're a part of so that there is some connection. And I think there are ways, ways to do this with what Ron was talking about is if you're really going to be looking at some of those issues around social justice, how do you embed them so that they're applicable and you're not doing a flavor of the month type of approach and values instruction um, so that they become real issues in the life of the school and, and kids take a look at themselves. I can think of a few years ago, well, actually many years ago now, most of my memories are pretty old, uh, many years ago when a, a group of kindergarten and first graders were really concerned about the, the um, debris and litter they were seeing around the campus and wanted to do something about it and explored. First of all, they did some research to see, you know, where was this litter coming from? How was it arriving? Um, and then did some research on what could they do about it and brought it back before the whole school as a measure of respect for each other and respect for our environment, which, you know, our, our social, emotional and equity issues of a significant kind along with stewardship and um, worked with the rest of the school to figure out how to problem solve that we could reduce this particular um, effort. 
again, it's, it's the application of the democratic learning that we want to do. It invites everyone to the conversation and it invites everyone to be a problem solver um, and assuming responsibility for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm wondering, Dr. Peters, when you're, you're talking about that, um, and, and uh, Ron, that it's very heavy topics, right, for, for elementary kids. Um, how are we able to then infuse like fun and joy and into those heavy topics so that they are able to have a sense of agency in there, but still, you know, enjoy it, enjoy learning about it, enjoy problem solving and so forth. Enjoy childhood. Enjoy childhood. Yes. yes. Yeah. So much of learning happens through action and through play and through creative building and working together. Unfortunately, in this country, we often leave that in kindergarten and we stop it in first grade. But boy, is it so important in first grade and second grade and third grade. Let me just use one example, just now of a positive thing that is it unites skills work with um, appreciation of citizenship. So um, I visited a kindergarten and they were studying their community and they went out doing field work in their community. Who are all the people that help our community? And they visited the firefighters and the police force and they visited the shelters and the library and all the different people that make their community what it is. And then the kids were writing personal thank yous to firefighters when I was there. They each had the name of a woman or a man or a person who was a firefighter in their community. And they were drawing a picture of them and writing a personal thank you letter. These were kids who were just learning how to write. And so they had to do draft after draft to get their penmanship right and their punctuation right and their capitalization right. And they were so obsessed with getting it right because these were heroes that they were writing to who would probably put their letter up on their locker. And it it was like their job to write to this one person. And so the fact that they did five or six drafts of it, they wanted to because they wanted it to be perfect as a gift to this person. So they were learning their spelling and their their spacing and their punctuation and their capitalization, just the same skills as we want them to learn, but with true meaning. Um, And they were having joy in it because they were so excited to be able to send this to the person they had met. So I don't think it's hard to connect the same skills as we want kids to learn with some meaningful work like that. And and Ron, as you say, when you have an audience that's going to be the recipient of your hard work, um, an appreciative audience, it really makes a difference. It gives purpose uh, on another level. And it's not like the soccer trophy that everybody gets when they leave the soccer field. It's much more meaningful because of the work and the effort that's put in. And, you know, I don't don't know that, you know, we make a distinction between work and play. That's a false one from from my perspective. Um, And as Ron noted, when you hit kindergarten, that's hard school. Even kids think that's hard school. Some, some kindergartners are very upset that their rooms have still opportunities to play because I'm not supposed to play anymore. This is real school. Um, so somehow switching that concept around that um, play is a broader concept than just having fun, doing nothing worthwhile. And we know how much kids learn from social interaction and play. I mean, it's huge and the whole creativity in so many ways. We don't allow older children to play enough and their play may be of a different kind. It may be playing with ideas um, or experimenting or doing the role playing that you were talking about earlier. Um, Pona's familiar with the sixth graders at Hanaha always um, have an annual tradition around uh, Olympic events as a team and oratory presentation. They've been doing this for years and years, but it's put within the context of developing a Greek polis and looking at the values that derived and have influenced our democratic structure of government, our architectural structures today, so that history gains meaning and application, and they begin to live the life of what would a polis member be like, so that they have to develop their own rules of operation and figure out what the consequences would be. How do they support each other? Those are ways that those things happen. And those can all happen at at even pre-K and K-1 when you sit with a group of children and you have serious conversations about 
you know, we're, why are we all here? And kids will have all sorts of reasons, but eventually they'll come up with to learn um, in their conversation. And then exploring with them, what does our room have to look like in order for everybody to be able to learn here? How, how do we ensure that everybody has a right to learn? You might not ask it quite in that way. And how do we let people know that um, respect what they're learning? Um, so that they begin to look at ways to live together with a purpose in mind. And children are never too young for that conversation um, because of those issues of fairness, I think, that, that Ron was talking about, but also that sense of they're moving out of their individual focus. So it's going to take some time, um, but it's happening. And they're within a social group where they get feedback about their behaviors. And so looking at ways to make that feedback something that's both reciprocal and receivable in terms of let's set up how we want this place to look and what the rules are under which we're going to operate so we can all learn together. You've developed your community of learners. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna push us to get a, a little heavy for a second or maybe a little critical, maybe not heavy, uh, critical for a second. Um, but but uh, before that, I would I'll I'll start off being just a little lighter, which is that um, you know I I had the good fortune of uh, of attending Hana Ho'oli under Bob's leadership, um, and um, you know being in an educational system that I think you know Ron you would you would very much recognize, and Bob uh, certainly uh, created where I, I I didn't realize why kids in the movies were trying to cut school like it it wasn't. I, I didn't understand why kids in TV didn't like school or there was that narrative. It was an amazing place to be, happiest place on earth. Um, and so uh, it, I know it's possible. I've seen it possible. Uh, I've seen it happen. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in the chat. I really appreciate everybody who's uh, participating in the chat. Um, you ask questions there. Mel and I will uh, try to elevate them as best we can. Um, Guy Turner uh, has certainly uh, is resonating with a lot of the stuff we're saying here, including uh, giving some examples uh, of the PCS that uh, he's at and his kinders engaging in that expedition uh, that, that Ron described. Um, and Joe uh, uh, Gorowski, uh, who I just talked to the other day, um, I know that he's doing a lot of stuff uh, based on, on your work, Ron. Um, so uh, let, let me, let's take all of that positivity, hold it, um, but also discuss, you know, some of these challenges and, and may, maybe I point out the challenges of a standard standards driven learning or standards based learning. Certainly, I don't think either one of you would aspire to a standards driven uh, learning environment, but help us help us understand a little bit how we balance that. We talked about skills and, and it's a little bit of the same conversation, but if if we would agree that. Um, it's ridiculous to say that every human being should learn the same thing at the same time in the same way. Uh, that's a ridiculous uh, proposition. Uh, then how do how do we as educators? How do how does it, all of all of the people who are joining us right now um, that are working in systems that might ask us to be a accountable to standards? How do we mediate that? Getting kids out into the world, doing expeditionary learning, doing real things, responding to real problems in the world, still in this construct that uh, might demand us to be accountable to standards. Ron, I'm sure you've worked a lot of, uh, with this in developing curriculum that is integrative, that is meaningful, that is impactful, um, yet as you develop it, you know, needs to be aligned or integrated in some sort of way. Absolutely so. And, and I would guess most of your listeners are in public schools. And when you're in public schools in America, you're beholden to state standards. We have no federal standards. But I don't think we should look at those standards as a prescription of how we have to have kids help to meet them. Those standards are goals for kids to have competencies and skills and content. And we should think of creative and powerful and empowering ways for kids to meet those standards. To, to meet them with grace, to meet them with beauty, to meet them with creativity, to meet them with, to exceed those standards. So I think we have to look at those standards and think and understand them carefully because that's what kids and teachers are held accountable for. But we don't have to have low level work for kids to do to meet them, right? We should have creative and empowering work for kids to do to meet those standards. 
and and you know Ron has much more conversance with the uh, standards part of the world than I do, uh, but but I certainly have, in my work with Wiley in particular, the conversation around standards has, has always um, of a high priority in the minds of teachers, and sitting down and exploring what are the different avenues that standards can be achieved as opposed to looking at them as prescriptions of process and prescriptions of content. Um, but instead looking at them perhaps more in terms of conceptual standards than even some of the more specifically defined standards for particular ages. Um, you know, when I think of some of the Hawaii content standards, I can think of ways that the kindergarten and first grade um, standards around rules and government can be integrated and foundationally built because it's not that standard as it's stated that you want a child to be able to explicate when they end first grade. And it may be that they've just tasted that standard. It's developing understandings that we're really about here, I think, and developing the skills. So as you find ways to, to uh, look at what is engaging students and is important for them to learn. And I'm frankly not convinced the standards as identified are necessarily important for all kids to learn, but they are defined as important. Then figure out what standards they apply to. I, I think the real danger and the worry I have around standards besides standardization of learning for all children, which is scary since none of them are the same and they develop differently, although along a similar trajectory, um, the, the other issue in my mind is that they're not, in my view, often developmentally appropriate. They're really geared for specialists and disciplines um, more than they are for children who are learners, particularly at the elementary level. And, and I think that balance has to be made. Now, I do think if that's going to happen, and Ron, I don't know if you would agree with this, Administrators have to give their teachers permission to pursue that type of an approach so that they have the flexibility to design what they know will engage children as appropriate for them um, and address the standard as they're presented. One of the, one of the ways that I've, uh, I've tried to help um, my faculty look at standards uh, I, I, th I think um, Ron really resonates. Uh, I, I, I think it aligns with what you said around standards being uh, maybe more of a, um, a guide to help us understand what the next stage of development is uh, at their best, right? I don't think, like Bob, like you said, I, I don't know that they often do that, or certainly they don't all do that. Uh, and I, I don't know that they often do that um, and so the body of standards makes it a little more difficult for for this to be useful for teachers in the classroom. But uh, if if I have this, uh, if I'm a, an elementary school teacher and I'm responsible for math and science and reading and writing um, and social studies uh, and all of the electives or many of the electives, uh, I, I I might not be that content and skills-based expert in all of those areas. So if I had a, 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 a trajectory or a continuum, for example, that I helped me understand where my kid is now, what can they do now and what might their next stage of development be, that body of standards then becomes really helpful for me. It helps me figure out where they are and helps me as an educator uh, know how to help them progress next. I've seen people who are really good at like conferring in the workshop model. Uh, do that really well, sitting with kids and getting to know what where they are in their next stage of development. And I've seen standards be really helpful in that. I've seen them be really unhelpful when we're teaching uh, standards. Where, when 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 I am a you know what what do you do for a living? I teach math uh, mm -hmm. rather than what do you do for a living? I teach kids. Right? Are we teaching uh, kids math or are we teaching math to kids? And I think that's a gigantic uh, difference in how we approach using the standards. Um, just my uh, experience there. Um, I was, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mel, please. I, I was just going to say, Kopono, that, um, you know, when you look at standards in, in terms of a progression, how you just described, mm -hmm. it also gives educators permission to look at it from a strengths-based based approach. Yeah, yeah. So you can say, this is what this child can do right now and what is the next step versus this child can't do 
X, Y, Z. Um, and I think that's a very powerful shift uh, for educators. And, and as a parent myself, you know, it's, it's nice to hear what my child can do and what the next step would be versus the things that are, are not working perhaps. Yeah. I, I think teachers need to be taught how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think they see that this is my outsider's view. But my sense is their perception of standards is that they're prescriptive and they need to be taught at a particular time at a particular grade level because of the way they're designed. Now, there's a little bit of a range more now than there used to be years ago, which is helpful. But some conversations, again, around how you use standards as a tool to uh, support student learning uh, might really be helpful rather than looking the perception of standard as a uh, something you have to follow and you have to do it at a particular age level a particular grade level. Okay, standards pushes me to uh, think about uh, what's been in the news a lot recently are NAEP scores, uh, aff uh, affectionately referred to as the nation's report card. Um, and you know, if any, anybody on YouTube or Facebook uh, and uh, watching us now, um, uh, you know, any of us that are tapped into to education right now, I, I think we've been just bombarded with article after article and report after report about plummeting scores and and the desperate situation and this, uh, you know, this current NAEP um, and how, how, you know, dramatic drops that we've seen and, and all of this rhetoric that's been going on. Um, Ted Dinnersmith, uh, our, uh, the, uh, one of the founders of, of What School Could Be. Uh, the founder of what school could be with Ken Robinson just wrote an op-ed about this. Um, and uh, I, I want to show a, a graph of what the scores actually look like. Um, it's, it's certainly uh, doesn't look like plummeting uh, to me. Uh, scores from 1990 to 2022. There is a dip, right? You can see that uh, from, 19, uh, from 2019 to 2022, uh, there is a dip specifically in eighth grade mathematics. Um, but all, all of the scores uh, in general go down a smidge. That looks pretty flat. Anyway, um, question to you guys. Um, what should the role of these types of assessments be? And uh, what, what kind of conclusions are you two seeing or drawing from this, uh, this most recent NAEP? Um, if it's okay, Mel and Capono, I'd like to use a metaphor for a moment here. My concern with NAEP is that people are seeing schools as ERs, as emergency rooms. My mm -hmm. wife is a nurse, so this is the way I think of things, which is like kids got broken over the pandemic, so we have to fix them. Mm -hmm. And I think emergency rooms are super important. I mean, when we have a traumatic accident or a traumatic illness, we want to get to emergency room and stem the crisis. But our recovery doesn't happen in the emergency room. Right. Our recovery happens from physical therapy when we have to take control of getting back on track. So we work with a physical therapist. They give us a diagnosis of what's weak, what we need to work on, what exercises might help. And then we take agency like we have to do those exercises. We have to believe in it and be motivated to do that. We're in the recovery phase. We're not in the in the trauma phase. Now we have to figure out how to empower kids to understand what they're good at, what they need to work on next and motivate them to want to get better. We need to give them meaningful, exciting work, high level work. We're not trying to fix them. You can't fix a learner, right? A learner has to feel like they want to get better, that they're excited to get better because kids growth will come directly proportionate to how much they care and how much they feel like they belong in school and people like them and they like school. Like It has to be attending to their social emotional health, attending to their spirit and their academic mindsets and their academic identities. We have to get kids back on track in a holistic way, not by trying to fix parts that are broken. I, I just think it doesn't work that way. You know, it, it, it strikes me that I totally agree. And, and the diagnosis piece is, is really the critical piece. And, and if we could have a different approach to looking at schools, looking at children as our responsibility is to figure out where are they at now and to take move them forward or help them move forward. I don't mean to move them. As opposed to where should they be um, and what is missing? What's the deficiency? 
it is that strength approach that Mel was talking about earlier, I think, that we need to capitalize upon here. And the, the troublesome piece to me is the catastrophic uh, media response to these scores. And while we know of some people who were saying that was necessary in order to wake people up to do something about it, I'm not sure. Um, I think what Ron says is so critical. It, it's not a problem that we fix. It's a problem that it's not even really a problem. It's where kids are and how do we help them to grow um, and to develop. But that's really the issue here. The other thing that's happened is that those scores have been politicized, totally. Um, and so the issue became one of schools should have stayed open or schools should have closed, you know, um, and that closing of schools caused problems. Well, that's not looking at children holistically. Maybe struggling from the SEL type issues and Ron was referencing. Um, there may have been um, food instability or insecurity during this time period. They may have lost family members. Their parents may Oh, Bob, Bob, we lost you for a second. I think your mic is, uh, uh, I don't know, we lost, we lost your sound. There you go. Um, you know what? I probably put my hand in front of it. It's something I typically do when I'm talking. Um, anyway, the, the, the issue is that there are so many factors that affect where children are at right now that we need to look at children holistically again and saying these are learners who need our support, who need our nurturing. Um, let's figure out what they need and then figure out how do we go about providing and meeting their needs in a way that prompts them to want to be learners? I, uh, I was struck by one of the, uh, a report on NPR, which was uh, for the most part, fairly, um, fairly moderated uh, in its response, but certainly started out with a, a hyped headline to, to get our attention and to have us click on the report. Uh, but one of the data points was uh, parsing the NAEP data and looking specifically, I, I believe it was LA uh, Unified uh, uh, or, or LA County uh, data, but that um, eighth grade reading scores in uh, that district actually went up during the pandemic, uh, which um, you know the sensationalist might then say, uh, maybe kids shouldn't go to school. Maybe uh, <laughs> staying out of schools, uh, schools might be actually uh, causing damage to to reading, which certainly I don't think any of us believe, but it's kind of that that weaponization of 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 education to make a political point, which is certainly really dangerous for our kids right now. Mel, you're you're a, you're a parent. Your kids are how old are your kids? Uh, almost seventeen and twenty one now. <laughs> oh my goodness how how is how has it been being a progressive ed parent with a seventeen year old? Uh, in the midst of all of this uh, nape hype and post-COVID uh, recovery uh, and kind of emergency room response that Ron was talking about? Yeah, well, I would say that um, there were a lot of things discovered during the pandemic uncovered that we have an opportunity. I think we still have a small window of opportunity um, to work on. Uh, Bobby had mentioned like the food insecurity, for instance, and you know, I think what's weighing on my heart is that last year we were able to provide uh, free meals, breakfasts and lunches for our kids. And why can't we do that anymore? What happened to that, that piece? Um, you know, I, I, I saw kids being able to um, really get engaged in their learning to do things that they wouldn't have the opportunities to do otherwise while they're in a classroom they were able to go out and explore in their backyard or their neighborhood or their park. And it feels like all of that learning right now is being boxed up again in the name of, of the, the narrative of learning loss that's happening. And so you know, I'm wondering if, if you folks have any thoughts on that as well. Now, now what would you recommend be done differently at this point? Um, I think having time for kids to choose what they want to learn is really important, really embracing that student-driven learning piece. Um, I think that was key. I think another thing is that kids weren't um, 
needing to sit at their desk or in front of a computer for hours on end. You know, they were able to learn something quickly and then they had an opportunity to apply it. And I'm not sure that that's happening now, um, now that we're back to normal, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah. I had a conversation with some high school kids uh, uh, earlier this year, now that we're, you know, we're back and, 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 and hopefully uh, not, you know, back and forth like we were last year. Um, and uh, we were kind of, uh, we, we were, we were measuring uh, or thinking back about, you know, how much time it takes for a high school kid to do the game of school. Uh, and we, we talked for a while. It was a really nice conversation. Uh, but our conclusion was, uh, the, the requirements of school, uh, what, what the kids affectionately called the game of school in that conversation, was about two hours a day. Uh, in about two hours, if given uh, correctly packaged content and uh, regurgitation-like practice, that everything that a, a typical school curriculum asked them to do could be done in two hours. And then they could go and do what they really wanted. Um, and, and certainly we were, we were reducing the conversation to its, its simplest form around, uh, what a typical school was asking. And Mel, like you said, many of them were, were, uh, were extremely happy and, and overwhelmingly positive to be back. Um, but a lot of it was the social part of it, that they wanted to be around their friends and they wanted to be in community. And part of their sentiment was that, um, did, did this not just expose the fact that everything our teachers uh, want to get done with us, we could really get done in two hours. Uh, and then maybe we could just go hang out on the quad with each other for the rest of the time. Uh, Cause that game of school uh, is a lot slimmer than we think it is. Capono, there's a story in your book about what a family did in particular during the, the pandemic and how they were able to explore their culture. Did you want to share that maybe a little bit? I'd, I'd love to, if you remind me what I wrote about. Oh, <laughs> I think that family had decided maybe to stay home instead of going through a, a, a hybrid sort of situation. And during that time period, they were able to better explore their, their cultural practices and um, learn about their language a little bit more. And so all of the things that they wouldn't normally have time for, that they actually took that that time during the pandemic to explore and to really dive deeply into. Yeah, actually, um, what I would say is even more personal than that. Our family, like my personal family, um, I think that it was it was really hard professionally. But as a family, uh, it was pretty neat to be able to to be together and to explore. Uh, we uh, uh, being able to go bike riding with your kids every day. Uh, and not every family had that luxury or privilege. Uh, people were out there in very different situations uh, than our family was. But being a family of two educators who were, you know, smashed, busy, crazy for six hours a day, but then home as soon as that was done uh, and being able to go and uh, ride a bike with your kids every day for a year and a half uh, was really, really neat and an amazing, uh, amazing gift. Uh, thanks for bringing it up. Um, Jennifer Klein in the chat, uh, the co-author of my book, is uh, is recounting a little bit about that story. Uh, and so Jennifer, I really appreciate you putting that up in the chat over there. Thanks. Um, I I I want to um, I, I, I want to give us a little bit of a time to come back to some really cool positives. I know uh, Joe, who's on uh, YouTube now. Uh, is at a school district in Colorado. And Ron, uh, that school district has been using Austin's Butterfly, which is one of my, as I started off by saying, you know, it's one of my very, very favorite resources. Uh, I go back to it all the time. It's, it's brilliant, as everybody uh, probably tells you all the time. Um, and Joe was recounting to me uh, the work that I think they've done with you, um, or certainly they're doing at their school, using um, that, that peer feedback model of kind, uh, specific, and helpful as the core of their social emotional practices in this time where, uh, you know, even the term SEL, social emotional learning is so politicized and weaponized to kind of go back to what we were talking about. Um, have you, have you worked with, uh, with, uh, Joe in that school district? Are you familiar with the people using this? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of Joe and, and his school. And I, I think, you know, at EL and many other organizations and, and, 
educators feel the same way. We don't separate character from academics. I mean, you're a whole person. So the way school happens with you and to you shapes who you are as a human being. We don't have any choice about that. A school can't say we're not going to teach character because the way the school happens makes you a more courageous and kind and compassionate and honest and tolerant person or less so. And so I think we have to be explicit and, and intentional in how we, we're not teaching character on Tuesday afternoons. We're teaching character all day long in the way we treat each other, that everyone should be treated with respect. Everyone should feel like they belong. Everyone from every identity and background should feel like they belong in school. Everyone should have a voice in school and we should treat everyone with respect and kindness. And that happens in math class and it happens in kindergarten class and it happens in the hallways and in the lunchrooms. Like you learn character through the way you live together, not through just a lesson. And, and, and I think as Joe was pointing out, critique is an important, important part of it. Like we have this structure in EL schools called crew, which is an advisory, a circle that happens every day where you're in a small group and you sit with your crew, your advisory group every day and they support you, but they also give you feedback cool feedback if you're not being your best self. I mean, they hold you accountable to be your best self. So it's kind of like your family at school. They keep you on track academically, but they also keep you on track as a human being to give you feedback, kind, specific, and helpful feedback about how to be a good person in the world. That, re that reminds me of, again, that K-1 group that I was referencing earlier, where they have agreements about how they're going to function and at the end of the day, gather in a circle and share their appreciations for what went really well, what others have done for them. But at the same time, it's an opportunity to have a conversation. It's not quite a ho'oponopono type of experience that um, Hawaiians are familiar with, we in Hawaii are. But it gives that opportunity to um, share put-ups, as they call them, rather than put down, And to, um, there's another one, soft somethings, and I can't remember the name of it right now, um, that, that are sharings with things that others have done for each other, but also that opportunity to say, you know, this happened to me today and it made me feel this way. Um, and I wish such and such had happened or someone had done that. So there is an opportunity then for the adults to join in to help direct the conversation if necessary, but mostly it's handled by kids. Neat. Um, I, 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 uh, I've used Austin's butterfly a lot and I hadn't pushed into, uh, it as, uh, as social emotional, uh, work. And I was, I was really fascinated with that. I was, I was, uh, uh, it, it struck a chord with me. Um, I, I, I want to talk a, a little bit about, um, uh, what, what we should be looking towards in the future. Uh, if you guys had uh, one area of education um, that you would that you're thinking about that you're uh, putting some time and energy in that you think is uh, on the horizon or maybe it's happening now already but uh, where where are each of you putting your attention and, and thought right now with regard to education Ron I'm gonna let you start this one <laughs> well I, I mean I there's so many places Capono but I'll just name one thing um, you know, one of the mottos at EL Education is contributing to a better world, like getting smart to do good. And I just think it cuts across political differences. It cuts across geographies and communities. Like who doesn't want their kids to be good citizens who are trying to make their communities better places? It seems like a resonant value for all of us. And, and I, I really, I, I love the idea of connecting kids' work at school to how are they contributing to a better world through their work through their writing, through their artwork, through their research, through their science work. Like, how do they connect the work they do to, to an audience, as you said, Bob, that's beyond the classroom? If it's the paintings they make, if it's the scientific research they do, if it's the people they interview in their community to write books about them. like Once kids are thinking the work I'm doing is gonna make the world a better place, it taps into a beautiful side in kids and it makes them better people and better citizens at the same time as they're becoming better scholars. To me, that that's what we could all tap into, and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a, a, a polemic issue. Like we we can all embrace making making the world a better place. You know, if I, I think Ron is absolutely right, if education is going to serve the purpose of its intent, or as Dewey would say, 
it needs to improve the quality of life for everyone. That, that should be the outcome that we're seeking. Um, and I think what's encouraging to me are programs like Ron's. Um, I see it happening in other settings. Obviously, Hanaharoli is the place I'm most familiar with. Um, and I see the social equity issues there um, being highlighted. Um, and I, I want what I want to, though, caution people is to do so with care that they don't put burdens on children that are adult issues. That I worry about a little bit um, because we live in a world where so much information floats and there is so much intensity of emotion. And we know that parents particularly want the best for all their children. All parents are after that outcome. Um, but that best needs to be achieved through civil conversations and shared goals. And so bringing communities together around what do we value uh, in, in our communities, those kinds of conversations have to happen and how do we address the equity challenges so that children in schools can appreciate the opportunities that are offered to them and build on those, those opportunities. And we look at education less as a utilitarian outcome, but more as a social uh, impact outcome. I am going to use that as a jumping off point to uh, put a, a, a soft stop on this conversation. Soft stop because uh, this has been uh, really amazing and I hope to be able to continue it with both you and, and Bob and, and you as well, Mel. Um, I, but I want to tell you what we're focusing on as an organization, what school could be and some of the things coming up. Uh, in just two minutes, we have our very first session of Project Playground. Um, Ted Dennersmith, our founder, is going to be hosting uh, a really neat book study uh, using the What School Could Be book. Uh, we're going to do four sessions where uh, we'll work with teams to create a small project uh, that we uh, will work with you on to coach you through. And hopefully that small project, uh, through that small project, we'll see some really big changes in your school. If you uh, have time to join us and you want to uh, jump on in a minute and a half, uh, you can use the QR code or you could go to our community uh, and join Project Playground. In addition to that, I want to tell you about two other things that are coming up. Uh, our fall series of micro-credentials um, have launched right now. Um, you still have time to join the fall micro-credential cohort. Uh, we have micro-credentials accredited by High Tech High Graduate School of Education in each of our five playlists, student-driven learning, mobilizing your community, real-world challenge, uh, evidence of deeper learning, and caring and connected community think uh, each of the micro-credentials, uh, all of the micro-credentials in totality really do cover a lot of what we talked about today. Uh, I really encourage you to go look at that. Uh, they come with continuing education credit, uh, which is really helpful. Uh, and finally, I'm really excited uh, to announce our master's program in uh, collaboration with two revolutions uh, and Spalding University in the US and Bolton University uh, in the UK. Uh, master's in teaching and learning and master's in educational leadership uh, in uh, learner-centered schools and systems. Um, it's going to be a really, really amazing program that uh, through uh, support of TED, we've been able to get down to $11,500, which is uh, pretty cool for a master's program um, and certainly one that I would have wanted to go through. On that, um, as we come to the top of the hour, I want to thank Mel Ching, uh, my co-host. Uh, Mel, thanks for being here. Uh, and a huge mahalo and thank you to Dr. Bob Peters uh, and Ron Berger. I really appreciate your guys' time. It's been a really amazing hour. I wish we had more time. Uh, but look for the recap of this on YouTube, um, a cut-down version uh, on the What School Could Be podcast. Please go check that out. It's an amazing uh, series. I think we're almost up to 100 episodes now. It's been great to see everybody. Have a great day. Bye. -bye. Bye.